How's everyone doing tonight? Great, thank you so much for coming out. I am Mario Rosero. I'm the Senior Vice President for Education here at the Kennedy Center, and I have the great honor of uh, sharing the great artwork and the artists that we work with here at the Center from here out across the nation. So tonight we are really thrilled that we can give you a sneak peek of a very special program that we have. This is the third year of our Citizen Artist Fellows Program. You can see in your program book tonight some more details, but last May, as we were thinking about the 100th birthday of President Kennedy and thinking about how to celebrate him, we looked at his legacy, his history, his work, and we said, wow, these themes of service, justice, freedom, courage, and gratitude are really emerging from his work. And how can we honor him and his legacy as his memorial every day through the arts. And so one of the steps that we took to do that was to start our Citizen Artist Program, which recognizes artists and communities all over the country that use their art form to give back to their communities. And so in our third year, we have this year's cohort. There are five amazing artists that have been with us all weekend for a retreat where we really have an exchange. And we, as a big institution, have a lot of questions to ask the individual artists as they do of us. And we're building really strong bonds to help propel them into the next challenges that they're facing. So tonight, you're gonna see this performance that is really a multimedia, multi-genre piece where they're each bringing their strength to the table. Um, I want you to read the detailed description in your program book because it's really eloquent. But in my words, this is really the idea of how when we work together, as a country and through the arts, we can really be heart healthy and we can be healthy in body, mind, and spirit. And so they're gonna express that in a number of ways tonight. So I'm just gonna say a few words about each of them and uh, some special guests that are here and then we'll get started. But we're really thrilled. We have uh, Shapong Lu is a wonderful musician that's coming from Boston, Massachusetts, poet, Donnie Rose from Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Artist and educator Justice Harris from Chicago, Illinois. Rulon Tangan, dancer and choreographer from Santa Fe, New Mexico. And Omar Effendum, who's a hip hop artist coming from Los Angeles, California. So you can see it's a real uh, breadth of the country. And so when they join forces, it's pretty powerful. They are joined with special guests Anne and Miko, the Uptown Boys and DJ RBI. So before we begin, I also would like to just recognize that the Kennedy Center in Washington, D.C. sits on Piscataway lands, and we just want to pay tribute to the First Nations that were here before us, and we're going to continue that throughout this evening. So how about a thunderous round of applause for my friends and colleagues that are coming out? Thank you. Uptown Boys, we're a local DC drum group. Before we begin, we'd like to acknowledge that we're on Piscataway land, the original peoples of the DMV area. Uh, this first song is going to be a prayer song, so if you have the ability to do so, please stand as we sing this song. The second song um, is going to be a grand entry song, so you'll see some exciting things happen as we sing that. So as we sing the second song, you can sit back down, but this first song, please, if you have the ability to do so, stand. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 
Tonight, we're going to share 1,260,000 heartbeats. This is a rhythm that we're not going to be able to hear, and we're not going to be able to see it, but can we feel this rhythm? Can we feel the vitality that moves through us? This is the expected gesture when our anthem is played. What if beyond the words that we hear, this was to actually feel what unites us as people? My name is Justice Harris. When I was 14, I was diagnosed with diabetes, and I had another label given to me, which is diabetic. All of us, at some point in our lives, whether it's just for a few days or maybe an entire stage of our lives, go from being people to becoming patients. A positive result might alter our life forever and alter our, alter our identity. Stage four may have nothing to do with the performance. When I was just 14, I was told, I'll have 12 years less to live because of the condition I have. And all of a sudden, the number 12 became important. These numbers and these labels can make us feel like aliens in our own body. They can be the dividing line between feeling like a person and feeling like we've lost our humanity somewhere. 3,360 is the number of times I drew blood from my fingers to treat and test myself for diabetes the first year I had it. Beyond these type of samples and tests we do if we're living with conditions, no matter what they are, how can we go beyond isolating who we are and see the big picture? If you look up almost any chronic condition, this is diabetes, you don't even see one face in the results that come up on Google. There's no human being associated with it. It's just the devices. It's just the words. And so after 10 years of having diabetes and testing and testing and feeling like I didn't know myself any better than the first few months of after I was diagnosed, I thought, what can I do as an artist to transform this experience? And could art possibly be just about living. This is what diabetes looks like and what many conditions can look like as the numbers that you see when you go to a doctor, when you download the data. This looks like the stock market chart. This is not human. This does not connect with, I would say, 99%. The investment bankers in the room, let me know who you are. And so, as a sculptor, I thought, how can I make this experience as physical and as tangible as my body? Something that I cannot ignore. Something that I can understand in a universal language. So I took not just one week, but an entire month with thousands of data points of blood sugar and created forms that describe at a glance, this was not the best month, but this was a higher blood sugar where spikes could actually summarize that was high blood sugar. I can feel that. Where smooth ridges on the form could actually be the times where my health was going well and things were going smoothly. And where dips in the form were the low blood sugars, which can be fatal. They, they're serious, they have to be felt, but where it could all be in the same place, in the palm of my hand, off the screen, somewhere that you can remember where each side is a week, each point is a day, there can be comparison that's made, and it doesn't matter what language you speak. And so, 
over time, instead of seeing another graph added, another chart added, there are distinct forms of art and sculpture that summarize that time and where it doesn't become a blur. Because in the future I want to live in and also create more of, understanding health can be like holding someone's hand. It can be that real to other people. I want to show you the contrast between the medical world and the world interpreted in another way that's possible. So the question is, in a future, how can this be the view of health? How can this be what we remember the most to something that's more individualized and even for the same condition could be different for different people? Imagine whatever health condition you might have. 80 million people in the US have some form of diabetes. It is also a vascular condition, so it affects your entire body. These are all portraits of people with diabetes holding their health in a different way, in a way that's customized to them. What if that were your experience? Where as individual as you are could be the way you see your health displayed back to you. So for Sarah, the ranges in her health could be in a form that's shown differently than in my own. And so when I interviewed her, that was the experience we talked about. How could something like infusing insulin and you remembering the physical needles you put in your body be translated into a form that actually shows you what were the insulin levels over time? How maybe did they relate to your hormone cycles? How can that be something you focus on instead? Instead of the countless strips that you put into the meter to test, you could see a form that actually, when it's fully blossomed, means you tested the amount of times to avoid those super highs and lows that you miss if you don't. Or what would it look like to go into a clinic or a doctor's office where you weren't looking at a white wall, you were looking at something actually creative that inspired curiosity? What would that look like to you? And beyond just information and data, what would it even look like if the word diabetes or an, any other condition had a different form? If it were a pendant, if it were a symbol, that you could recognize those millions of other people around you that you think you don't share anything in common with. Our conditions are part of our connections if we can see that within one another. We're not just statistics. We share so much more in common than we realize. We are part of one another's solution. If we see one another, we are part of one another's solutions. If you think about that, what can that mean for you? And is it invisible to you now? We are all part of one another's solutions. Fact, the heart can continue beating even when it's disconnected from the body. 
We are a nation of immigrants, visitors of a land previously inhabited, divided by self-imposed borders. If America is the body that houses our collective heartbeat, what happens when its people constantly dodge the shared spaces in efforts to stay within the tribalism of our own corners? I was born well after segregation was made illegal in a small Louisiana city that get, didn't get the memo. Every face in my upbringing shared a similar hue, and when it was different, it was symbolic of institutional hierarchy my zip code was not privy to. The rhythm of my neighborhood was akin to the diasporic beat of the clanking bodies that got us here. We were all pushing against poverty, attempting to run from the heartbreak of second-class citizenry and mostly ill-fit to exercise our rights to equity. Schools crumbled around me. Churches and liquor stores sat adjacent. It was hard remaining heart healthy when corner stores carried pork rinds and cops carried chest opening artilleries and orders to flatline black lives on streets occupied by those the city deemed disposable. Fact, the human heart beat about 100,000 times per day, about three billion beats in a lifetime. That's over 32 trillion heartbeats in America daily. Yet we still can't find the heart to keep families together at the border. I remember immigrating to the United States as a child. That same year, my father suffered his first cardiac arrest, overworked and stressed. He was able to turn things around and live long enough to watch us all become citizens eight years later. I remember him coming home with little American flags to plant in that front yard, not knowing that the following year after his second massive heart attack, we would be burying him in that same Virginia soil just a few miles away. I remember him breathing his last, it was just me and him in the 5,800 miles that separated us from the horrors of his birthplace. What, what a, a journey. journey. And though it wasn't always easy, still, it was relatively privileged in comparison to the millions seeking refuge from the horrors of Syria today. Horrors that can't be easily disconnected from the ones inflicted upon the people of Iraq, Iraq Afghanistan, Afghanistan, Palestine, Palestine Yemen, Yemen, Somalia, Chicago, Chicago Ferguson, Ferguson, Standing Rock and countless other places bearing the brunt of our tax dollars in the form of bombs and bullets. That, that dark, dark, depressing, depressing B-side to the American dream that gets muffled when the anthem plays. Calling Collins' kneecap to Mother Earth like, like a stethoscope. Checking in, a breath of hope, a second wind. Resuscitating Lady Libertas after she nearly drowned in the contaminated waters of Flint, Michigan. A new lease on life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness for every one of us, including the 500 plus children at our southern border still wondering when and if they will see their families again as I read these words to you today. Fact, about 610,000 people die of heart disease in the United States every year. That's one in every four deaths. Heart disease is the leading cause of death for both men and women. A couple months after my father's passing, my eldest sister was diagnosed with cardiac sarcoidosis a rare disease in which clusters of white blood cells called granulomas form in the tissue of the heart. Several surgeries, an implanted defibrillator, and a couple pacemakers later, she was deep sea diving off the coast of Oman, climbing mountains in Malaysia, and running marathons in Dubai. She effectively transformed that most difficult chapter in her adult life and our most painful family memory into an insatiable will to not only live, but thrive. She is a living, breathing example of the type of courage our nation must learn to summon in order to fight the disease spreading through our heartland, blocking the pathways to our collective understanding and growth. The bloody, complicated family histories can't be ignored when charting this new way forward. Rather, they must be acknowledged and harnessed as inspiration, fueling this art, this culture, this storytelling medicine that, that we, we all need, need to deal, deal to, to heal, heal, to let, let the change feel real. It's been a long time coming with more ups and downs than an EKG, but with eyes to the future and ears tuned to justice, our hearts may finally learn to beat to the everlasting rhythms of love, empathy, and mutual R-E-S-P-E-C-T, R-I-P, Aretha, fact. The average heart is the size of a fist in an adult. In America, in America a raised fist is a symbol of resistance. What if it symbolized an army of adjoined hearts? What if fingers uncoiled, palms open, and hearts interlocked in the name of progress? What if we endeavored to do something different? 
We are a nation of protests and clenched knuckles, gritted teeth of spit and roar and absolution, a citizenry promised equal footing that is in constant shuffle to center from out of bounds. We mostly identify as thorns on each other's side instead of who we could be if we bloomed from a shared garden. We are the byproduct of the myth of scarcity. Equality is an absentee founding father that traumatized us into forever fight mode. But what would happen if our fists retired from this battle and were reimagined as hearts pulsating in sync? What if our synergy released America from cardiac arrest? What if we decided that democracy would not die under our care? What if we cared enough to fight for the values we claim to cherish? Good evening, everybody. Thank you for being with us. My name is Shapong Lu, and um, I recently learned a fact about the heart from a friend who's a doctor. Um, our hearts have three mechanisms to remind it to beat. So if your heart drops a beat, um, actually it's called a pacemaker, your natural pacemaker is supposed to tell it to beat. If your heart drops a beat, uh, there's a backup mechanism that reminds it to beat, but it slows it down from 60 beats per minute to 30 beats per minute. And if that second mechanism fails, we have one third mechanism to help us out, and that slows us down even more to 20 beats per minute. And thinking of this metaphor of our heartbeat as a country, and we're dropping some beats, we're missing some people, we're missing some justice, we're missing some peace, we're missing some healing, we're missing some really important uh, dialogue to happen. And that's uh, one way that I tie into this theme with my project Code Listen, which is a project using music for healing and dialogue, bringing together Boston police officers, teen artists, and uh, people who are survivors of homicide. So if you're don't, not familiar with the term homicide survivors, that is someone who has lost a loved one to homicide. Um, and the piece I'm about to play for you is called Lullaby No Peace. And don't worry, everything's going to be OK. <laughs> um, but this piece uh, I writ wrote in 2016. Um, some of you may remember that summer, uh, a lot was bringing, being brought to the media attention around uh, police brutality, uh, around something that communities of color have been dealing with for generations of uh, being either hurt or killed by police. Uh, and there was also retaliation with police being killed. So that this was the summer that I was bringing this project together, and it has, it's continuing, it's ongoing project. Um, but the piece you're going to hear uh, shares with you some of the voices of folks I've been fortunate to work with through Code Listen. So um, with the exception of the protesters you may hear on this track, every single person's voice is a, a real person who I have the honor of having a relationship with, who I'm connected with in life. Um, and I 
believe that it's so important for us to reach beyond our immediate communities and our immediate experiences to build connections and relationships with people from different experiences and different communities um, as a way to move forward and heal our hearts and give us the jolt we need to get our our heart rates back to the right to the right place. So um, this summer 2016 and many of the people I was working with were telling me they had trouble sleeping, whether it was from their own personal grief of a very personal loss, or it was around all that we were being bombarded with in the news, finally coming to the surface about the reality of the problem we have around law enforcement and systemic racism in our country. Um, so this is uh, called the Levino piece. I hope you enjoy it. I'm not allowed to speak without permission from the Boston Police Department, my employer, so I have nothing to say. You know, I tell people, grieving is like anxiety, you never know when it's going to hit you. Some people I've talked to, they don't even want to go out of their house, they're scared to come out. They're scared to let their children go out in the yard and play. I forget where I'm going, you know, I, I, I hurt for my son so bad. I, I was at uh, the light, uh, this older white gentleman, he picked into the car and uh, made the statement, uh, another welfare collector in a brand new car. So that was kind of surprising for me working as a police officer in, a, in an unmarked police cruiser. Basically, I had to be labeled a welfare collector just because of my skin color. So it's like an epidemic right now. Our children's life matters, but I don't think our children think their lives matter. How do you grieve? People think oh, it's all about just crying, you fall apart, you break things up. But it's really deeper than that for a survivor who's grieving for a child that someone hurt. I don't think they feel that the cops feel their lives matter. So they have no respect for the cops, none whatsoever. I mean, you have to understand, you have a fraction of a second to react sometimes, you know. You don't know what that person is thinking. You don't know what that person has in his hand. You don't know what that person is trying to do. My son, he was taken tragically in such an awful, horrific way with a gun to his head. What's happened this week and what's happened a lifetime, we feel the same pain. We promise our kids, as parents, we're going to keep our kids safe. We're going to love them. Mommy got you. And so many of us mothers and fathers wasn't there for our children. And we feel that. You know what I'm saying? We were not there to protect them. I cry tears almost every day. I leave work sometimes in tears. I feel like a blindfold was like being taken off of me. To see her cry like broke that stereotype that cops don't feel pain. All cops do feel pain. Every cop that has killed a black young man, nothing has been done to him. They always be found not guilty. People say that cops don't have feelings and like you're all about authority. I think seven, eight-year-old grandkids sitting and watching TV, but they're killing people. Listen, Marilyn, you tell me to do this and that. I'm not going to no cop. That's the last person I go to. It's human rights. If you've been in those situations before, you have to keep another welfare director in a brand new car. I feel like I'm going to allow us to have it well. I feel like I'm going to allow us to have it well. I feel like I'm going to allow us to have it well. I feel like I'm going to allow us to have it well. I feel like I'm going to allow us to have it well.
carriers of water in our bodies when we carry life. We carry life. I don't remember the childhood I had being special. I came from a family of artists, so everyone in the family had talents and gifts that they hold. Everyone is a part of this learning and a part of this creativity that didn't make art seem out of the ordinary. So the fact that we were basket weavers didn't seem like a stretch of the imagination. We were just living the life that we knew. I come from a line of Hickory Apache basket weavers, and of those women, I am the fifth generation. represents a sacred animal, sacred because it transcends boundaries, it um, transcends water, air, and earth, and can exist happily in all of those places. We would go to the river, we would stop and gather sumac, or we would gather willow. I would watch my mother do this, sometimes I would help, but in learning that, I, I wondered why she chose some sticks over others. In learning how 
out to make baskets. You can learn by sitting and being taught, or you can learn often by sitting quietly and watching. Sitting and laboring through the process of making it. It's an exceptionally long process and it takes an incredible amount of patience. chose some sticks over others and I learned that she would choose them for their straightness so they would lend neatness to the basket or she would choose them based on whether or not they were new shoots or old shoots. New shoots were more malleable, easier to bend. Old shoots were stronger because they'd had more time to develop and grow. The process is very time consuming. There's a lot of work to be done before you can even begin weaving. Once you gather the material, you need to split each individual stick that you're going to use to weave into three or four, depending on how young the stick is. More if it's older. If you're going to use it as the base to be woven around, you need to peel the sticks, shave off all the bark, and make sure it's going to be smooth and paired with sticks that are evenly sized. And after you split each individual piece, each of those strands is in turn split again and you peel the bark away from the core of the stick. That is what you're going to use to weave around. You'll shave the bark off of the new shoots and you'll make sure those are all neat and consistent. We do all of this work making sure everything is consistent, making sure every strand is as close to being like the other strand as possible, so your work comes out neat. You also need to plan where you're gathering your materials. You can't go to the same spot every year. You have to consciously choose, um, maybe take a little from here, a little from there. You want to be kind just so you don't over-extract. You want to make sure the plant produces again and again. You're keeping a healthy balance between what you, you take and, in turn, receiving more next season. And once you have all of your materials prepared, you sit, and you sit, and you sit. This is where you you labor. It's definitely not easy. It's very hard on your hands because you're taking this very, very stiff, very strong material that likes to grow in straight lines and you're turning it into spirals. You're pulling it in a direction it doesn't want to be in. So you need to work with it as forcefully and as gently as possible because you're bending it to your will. And you're pulling it strand by strand into a container, into something that will hold perhaps water, food, or even something precious. And you sit until you're happy, until your work is what you want it to be. And when you're happy, you can close it with a braid.
Choose that divide we define The border is set truly aligned with our higher self So we are in our lowest frequency And frequently I seek to escape Needing to break the sanity of humanity Seen to be on the outs But we can navigate the path Choose another route Begin a new chapter Soon as the smoke settle This ain't gotta be us we can surely let go Echo of our beating hearts is the bleeding start Of stitching the seams that the vision split apart yeah. The beat binds 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 the beat Thinking of a master plan Uh huh Cause ain't nothing but the sweat on my mama brow But since we left the yep. mask It's one nowhere to settle down Running like the river Couple babies in the basket We get around Tupac Shakur, who's got the cure to stop the fury of cops and war over hollow ground? When hearts were pure, the bombs were not. Who's got some more to drop and harm the flock? Man, yes. you talk shit. Holes that we coming from. Yes. Then why you digging in this dirt that we running from? Uh. Black gold in the desert got them plundering. Huh. This ain't a jungle, but sometimes I'm like wondering how many more gotta die for you listen. Yes. Running out of breath, trying to catch your attention. Yes. Now ain't the time to go half on this mission. Give me liberty of death from this open air prison where it's too hot to fit in. No pot to piss in. Refugees, please, hands, knees, submission to yes. the most high. Crossing the seas, knowing most die. Praying a dry land close by. Now why try? Unless we thought that it was safer than the places we escaped from. Head heavy like a bass drum. Going wherever wind makes us. Tasting them papers that you take for. Granted, the beat binds the beat, binds the beat. Binds the beat, binds the beat, binds the beat, binds the beat, binds the beat. Say it with us, y'all. When I say the beat, y'all say binds the beat, binds the beat, binds the beat. When we say the beat, y'all say binds the beat, 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 binds the beat. Finds the beat, 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 you can't say heart without saying art, the beat, finds the beat. Binds, you can't say heart without saying heart. The beat binds the beat binds the beat the beat the beat 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 binds beat the beat the beat 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 by the beat 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 Thank you all so much for coming out to support this event tonight. Thank you to the Kennedy Center Citizen Artists staff fellows. This is such an honor for us to be here with you in Washington, D.C. Have a wonderful night and a wonderful evening. Peace. Au revoir.